we are human beings and we are frail and we are fragile and we disappoint each other and we disappoint ourselves and so love is that willingness to get in there over and over again and to keep seeing that fundamental goodness and to keep uh, energizing uh, our lives with that that quality of like yeah but i'm here and i'm doing this despite the fact that all of this is uh, challenging despite that it's difficult I used to say that if you asked me what meditation was in one word, I would say relationship. Of course, it starts with the relationship with ourselves. And that cultivating the relationship with ourselves is ultimately about not like having peace for ourselves, but actually being able to navigate how we relate to others, how we relate to the world. And so I think fundamentally, the whole purpose of anything that we do with ourselves is actually about the relationship that we have with others. Um, and most particularly the messy parts, because who cares when you're in your best behavior? But I think the bigger love that we talk about that fuels the whole of humanity, uh, everything that uh, matters is about love, and it is about our request for love or our sense of not being able to actually access that. Most of what we're doing on the planet as human beings is navigating our quest for love, or some might say connection, but uh, I think love is the way that I choose to express that. The, the thing that makes us human is our need to connect. If we're not connected, if we don't feel a sense of loving and being loved, then we actually are not human beings anymore. We, we've got bodies. We've got brains, we've got the parts, but we're not the thing, we're not the entity that I think of as like being human. And so the, the, the goal, I think, as we show up on the planet is to try to become more and more human. And mindfulness actually gives us a tool to facilitate the process of becoming more human. Uh, I think for many years there was a definition of mindfulness that talked about cultivating the relationship that we have with ourselves, but I, I actually encourage us to think of it as cultivating the relationship and the moment-to-moment -moment presence and awareness with ourselves and others. Uh, not because inherently it's not about and others, but I think sometimes we need to be uh, reminded of that verbally in a culture that's so much oriented towards individualization, we have forgotten that that is what we're here for, it is to be connected, it is to, we find peace not so that we can find peace with ourselves, we find peace so that we can function and love others. So our personal relationships inform who we think we are and how we think we are in the world. And when those relationships are fractured, then our relationship with a sense of justice is fractured. When those relationships are whole, nourishing, when they allow us to be fully who we are, then justice is the natural expression of that wholeness and that love. Uh, I think of justice as Cornell West has said, I was sort of annoyed that I didn't think of this first. But, uh, justice is, is love made public. And so I think of justice as the measure of our love. It's great to say that we have love, but justice is how we measure it. So you can say you love. And I think no one wants to say, well, I'm not loving, but do you express it as justice? Are you functioning in the world as a just human being? Are you functioning to extend love or justice? Uh, and, and so I think those relationships have everything to do with justice because the immediate expression of our lack of connectedness of love is not only an impulse to visit injustice upon people, but I think more broadly and more of a constant is the ability to ignore injustice. So there's, uh, we often talk about the people that do bad things, but the real crime in our society is are the people that ignore them. Uh, and when I say crime, I mean the, the crime to the human spirit, the crime to humanity, the crime to 
our purpose in life uh, are concordant with the other purposes that we may have. But the first purpose is to become more human and to love. So when we ignore injustice, we are actually denying our own humanity. Uh, one of the things I think that we do uh, is when we don't get the love that we need and the uh, sense of wholeness, the sense of recognition, the sense of honoring uh, for ourselves from the people that we perceive the need for love from, which is often our families of origin, um, then that extends into you know greater and greater spirals of the people in the communities that we're surrounded by and the and the greater and you know the people outside of our immediate community so it gets greater and greater and when we are not seen we don't feel seen then we feel un we're not equipped to see others that's a, just a natural orientation it's sort of like um that thing when you're driving or you're walking and human beings just know when their eyes connect. They know the difference between, oh, I was seen or I was not seen. There's a, there's a magic and, and truly magnetic energy that happens when human beings literally see and recognize each other. And we know that distinctly from seeing dogs or birds or and we, we can have love and connection with them, but the uh, particular energy exchange that happens between human beings is very, very distinct. And when we don't feel that in that larger sense, that sense of being seen, that larger version of that energetic connection, then we either try to find ways in, to fill that sense of emptiness of not being seen and not the kind of emptiness that we talk about in the Dharma, um, that emptiness that feels uh, like a like a pit in us. It feels uh, somewhat you know bottomless, and maybe in the dharmic traditions they'd talk about it as the hungry ghost realm, where we are, our bellies are big and our necks are small, and we feel insatiable in terms of uh, being able to get what we need, and we turn angry when we don't get what we need. We turn the sense of lack outward upon other people um, and most of us do it in that that you know that way that is really just about ignoring because we can't see other people because we're so caught up in the ways in which we're not seen and what we need and what's not happening for us then we're we fall to a, a, a degraded place of well you know I had to pull my own bootstraps straps up so why do I care if they're suffering? That's not my problem. And then we get very organized around a sense of just me, just mine. Um, even if the mine are, are the very same people that have caused that lack of wholeness to be a part of how we see ourselves. It's uh, so clear to me that the problem with our society is that we don't honor love as a value as a fundamental understanding of like who and what we are and who and what we are about. And that has everything to do with the founding of this country. Uh, that has everything to do with the power of this country in its sort of um, teenage years to, to be a, a, a big bully with a big stick, uh, but not the developmental maturity to, to not go and extend that kind of uh, it's kind of rage, rageful uh, way of being. It's un, it's immature way of being, and, and visited upon the entire planet. Our sense of being uh, disconnected that is embedded in the founding of the country it was how we literally it was literally organized that way. It was uh, not by accident. It's not just oh well, people are being people are different, and so they don't really like each other, or they are fear differences. There's some of that for sure. But we were designed that way. We were designed to make sure that uh, some people didn't connect with other people. So we made sure that uh, increasing numbers of Im immigrants if, as they came from European countries were disconnected from Native American peoples and disconnected from African uh, uh, peoples, and people of African birth and, and heritage as the years have gone by. So that's deeply, deeply deeply ingrained in the system. 
uh, and of the country, of in its institutions, in the in the corporations, in the way we think, in the way we perceive each other, it's uh, deeply encoded in our economic system, and w in that we value people based on the colors of their skin and their likeness to a perceived uh, sense of beauty. What is the optimal beauty and and all of that is very confusing for the human heart that wants to connect, that just wants to see and be seen, that rather actually find connection than to find division and a reason to be closed. But we've been nurtured that way, right? So it's not our nature, it's our nurture. And I want to say that one of the things that's um, probably not often said enough in the mindfulness sphere is that, and, and in some ways I think that this has very much to do with the disconnect from its Buddhist roots, there's a very significant distinction in the orientation of fundamental goodness than fundamental evil. That difference, as a starting point, decides everything about how you perceive other people. So it's they're doing the best they can when they're fundamentally good and there's something that you need to be able to work with with them in order to bring them back to their fundamental nature. But if they're fundamentally evil, then they're doing, if they're doing something wrong, then we understand them as doing what human beings do. And then they need to be punished, they need to be cordoned off from society, they need to be uh, divided from each other. And so we hold our entire society as a Western European based culture from a perspective of fundamental evil. And so it really dramatically changes how we organize all of society. Are we organized towards the healing of things or are we organized towards the punishment? Are we organized the, around the sense of how do we bring that person back to wholeness, those peoples back to wholeness? Or, or are we organized around how do we cut them off from society and associate whatever happens with them solely with them and that there's blame upon them, they're fractured, they're wrong, they're, um, they're ill-equipped, they're, they're, and, and then we can push them off to society. And we do that whether that's perceived as a crime, whether they're too old, whether they're too young, whether they're too feeble, whether they're too gay, or whether they're too, uh, black or whether they're too Latino, they don't speak the right language, however it is that we perceive them as too different and different from what? From a standard, right? We have to have a standard versus a sense of everybody is fundamentally good. Everybody is fundamentally here and they arrive on the planet as people that are uh, should be nurtured in, in their quest to find their full capacity as whatever it is that makes them come most alive. That's love and that's a society that is rooted in love. So I think that we often talk about the sense of like compassion can save our society, but I think it's really important that we recognize that at the root that the society has uh, disrupted some of the very, very significant aspects of what it is that would have allowed us to not have so many disruptions to begin with. Uh, that said, of course, compassion can, I think, uh, redeem us, is what I would say. Uh, rather than so much save us, it can redeem us. If we, we can, if we can, as human beings, as individuals, relocate our own sense of wholeness, our own sense of belonging that's disrupted and fractured in so many ways um, by patriarchy, by uh, valuing systems that are based in capitalism that says that some people are worth more than others, uh, by fractures with our families uh, in which things go unsaid or noticed or you know, maybe we, we showed up in a particular manifestation that our family is like, I, I don't know what to do with that. You know, you're, you're queer or you, you, have a, um, you, you, you have a fondness for brown people. And we don't, we don't, we're not quite sure what to do with that. And so there's a, there's a tightness and, and that thing in us that's fundamentally our sense of wanting to be connected uh, tightens. 
and and then we are we are disabled often from then seeing the way in which the the rest of the world is not somehow pitted against us for for most of us those kinds of things happen at the, at a time in our life i would say for all of us at a time in our life when it's not our within our capacity to make a different decision we're doing the best we can with usually our our young selves that, that need to be able to survive and we're we're willing to work with whatever's giving to us because that's what it means to survive as a child but as adult human beings it's it is our responsibility so i would say this it's not our fault but it's our responsibility we have a history that's for most of us it's not our fault we we're not actively participating in the injustice that is the foundation of the design of the country but as uh, human beings that that believe in our own humanity it's our responsibility to resolve the disconnect in ourselves that disables us from seeing the suffering and the disconnect that we have with others so it's not an act of trying to go save others it's an act of reclaiming our own wholeness and then naturally it arises the ability to as they say with Kuan Yin to hear the cries of the world to hear the cries of all of the world uh, it doesn't mean you're going to be able to actually do anything about all of those cries but you hear them and that ineffable quality of of a compassionate being is who you become and who you inhabit and, and then from there you just you, you just choose what it is you're going to work with and when you're showing up in that way with your wholeness into the capacity that you have you don't worry so much about the fact that you can't fix everything in the world mm-hmm. and in that way the brokenness that we experience as children from our families of origin our primary caretakers is healed because we have compassion for them too we have this love as a verb and the idea that love is just kind of there it is there but, but it has to be animated by our action by our choice by our willingness by our uh effort uh our like get in there our stick to it our show up again and again and again because we are human beings and we are frail and we are fragile and we disappoint each other and we disappoint ourselves and so love is that willingness to get in there over and over again and to keep seeing that fundamental goodness and to keep uh energizing uh, our lives with that that quality of like yeah but I'm here and I'm doing this despite the fact that all of this is uh challenging despite that it's difficult despite the fact that you know fascists take over whole you know nations at a time for periods of time it's it's that quality that keeps us evolving that keeps us truly human that enables us to look back and say oh there is a right side of history the reason that there's a right side of history is because we love and because we choose love and we choose that as an action we choose it in terms of hiding Jews in our homes and when we're Germans and we know that we'll get it in trouble it's the action of um letting black s- slaves come in your house and sh- shepherding them letting women uh come into your home on a domestic violence railroad so to speak it will come in the form of allowing uh muslim people to be able to uh, be in our homes and institutions and hold sanctuary for them if if it should come to that here in this country in, in this particular time uh when we make when we when we do those acts we remind ourselves of who we are in our wholeness we remind ourselves like oh that that's humanity not the not the thing that i've been told and mostly sold in our society this is this is humanity this is who i am this is who i was always meant to be and uh and then it becomes a new habit I don't think hate and love coexist. I think we must love, in fact, to 
really um, truly express love, we actually must love them as we are confronting poor behavior because human beings are not their actions. And if we get to thinking that their actions are who they are, then we, we are falling down the road of people are fundamentally evil. And so I think in that the, the most profound expression of love and the most profound test of our love actually is not just to love people that are doing things that are challenging, but to love people as we challenge them and confront them for those things that they are doing. We don't really know who we are until we do that. It's great to say it, but you don't really know until you can uh, hold, hold that love, the fire of love in your belly, in your heart, and allow that to be the force that compels you to confront injustice. That's what actually moves you. It's not the anger, it's not the hate. It's the sense of like, oh, this is beneath who you are as a human being. I know that there's something better for you. And the pushback is not about my pushback and you're not doing the thing that I want you to do but rather I, I hold the sense of wholeness for all of us. I hold the sense of potential and the possibility of our, of our collective humanity. And for that reason, I'm willing to uh, get in the way of this injustice, to disrupt it, to interfere, to intervene. And, and, I'm, and I do it with love for you. That doesn't mean that it's not fierce love. I love that we have wrath as a word and I think it, uh, one of the challenges is that anger is the only word we have that we use, but wrath is awesome. So wrath is not about anger, it's actually about love. It's fierce and it's powerful and it's inflamed and it's passionate and it's also often has like fire and whatever deities that you see uh, that are wrathful deities in, in different traditions. Um, but I, that's the thing that I think that we should begin to inhabit and rather than having this dichotomy of like either there's love or there's anger there's love that's a peaceful cool love that's awesome and beautiful and usually what we think of and it comes with you know still waters and all that but there's also like stirring fiery passionate love that moves and that acts and that takes its place and that is willing to be um, that's willing to disrupt, that's willing to get in the way, and that's willing to risk. Yeah, because if we're not willing to risk, then it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. I would love to encourage people to use their romantic love relationships to uh, get naked, uh, physically, but, <laughs> but also um, emotionally, that uh, I think that that's what they're there for. We reveal parts of ourselves that we don't reveal and we don't have cause to reveal to anyone else. And that, that revelation, that being seen, uh, is, is a kind of window into reckoning, right? To reckon with our lack of wholeness and the places that we need, that we're broken that we would like to have fixed, but we often keep them hidden. And so those romantic relationships allow us the opportunity to reckon with the parts that feel unhealed and wounded and we tend to hide. Um, and, you know, sexual frolicking and all of that is very good for romantic relationships too. But they're unique opportunities uh, often why most uh, monastic traditions don't allow for, uh, for sex with monastics because the, the love and the seeing is so close to the most divine love. It's, uh, love, it's like loving God, it's a, right? And so it dissipates the energy. It's like they're, they're one and the same. And so if you're, you know, if you, if you have a relationship with God or, you know, your, whatever your deity or the divine or the goddess, then it's, then it's uh, difficult to fully be seen in the same way with someone else. And so we often don't have those things together in historic traditions for, for thousands of years because people have come to realize that, that we often 
cannot fully and wholly do that being seen love with two entities at the same time. So if you're not in, the, uh, in a relationship with God or goddesses or divine or whatever that is, then I encourage you to use the romantic relationships in your life to um, keep, keep making your way towards being more, more fully seen. And that means then you'll have to learn to choose people that are worthy of seeing you um, and find the ways in which maybe you see yourself as unworthy. And, and that may not, and that may be why you're not choosing the people that are worthy of seeing you back. Hang on one sec. So as uh, as usual, those talks pack an awful lot of um, wonderful wisdom, I think. And uh, I've, I've listened to it two or three times now and I, I, seem, to get, I seem to get something um, so rich out of every time I listen to it and to challenge myself to show up to what love and justice really is. So I invite anyone else to sort of make any comments. I, I do have the the Word document there. Can, can you see it, Millie? It's good? Yeah, so. Um, so just, I don't have the opportunity to people. So if, if you want to uh, join in the discussion, please uh, unmute yourself. What a compassionate person she is. <laughs> She's so wise in understanding the racism that she must have met constantly. And all the other stuff that everyone who's a little bit non-standard meets every day. I like, um, I like what she says about accepting that it's, that it's not our fault, but it is our responsibility and, and what that might look like. And I, I think in my white privilege, I've realized that I really need to look at um, what that means and, and not keep hiding and keeping a distance from um, that lack of opportunity for others. And uh, so I feel like I'm in, in the really beginning stages of, of looking at that. And sometimes I've been sad that 
one of the things I've been sad about COVID is that we had this great report come out, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and I, I worry that, you know, all that, I don't, I can't remember, I think it's 190 recommendations will, the, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission will, will um, not be first and foremost in our minds. Um, it'll be getting through COVID and then the economic situation. And, and I feel that incredible document that everyone works so hard on will, will just be like a lot of government documents and um, shelved. So I think it's in, important for us to remind our governments of um, love and justice and that we are serving um, those people. Yeah, I really like that, um, that phrase that she said as well, that it's not our fault, but it's our responsibility. And, um, and also her encouragement to, to stay open, even though there's no way anybody can address all the issues that are happening out there um, you know, not, not to be overwhelmed by that, that we close down, but to, to still stay open, even though, um, there's only a very limited amount that is each individual that we can actually uh, do. I kind of feel um, too with COVID sort of, I mean, there's a lot of things that come up for people, but um, the, the idea that we're supposed to find our own wholeness in order to help others. But again, COVID has kind of taken us back a few steps because we're going back into survival mode and, and back into that individual um, need and not thinking as much of others and so yeah it's kind of an she just had a beautiful way of um explaining it um and sort of bringing clarity to some of it it's just one of the thoughts i had come up um you know i i was thinking about um this notion of being seen or or not being seen can can I be heard? Am I being heard? Yes, you are. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, you know, I think I think as children, when when the parental organization has been somewhat limited. And then when we get older, the experience of being seen or not being seen, um, it's just really, really so profound. But I think the beauty of spiritual practice and the cultivation of spiritual practice is the antidote to not being seen. Because in spiritual practice, we are seen you know, like awareness sees us, mindfulness sees us, the gods or the goddesses or the deities, we are being seen in those ways. So, you know, it really behooves us to cultivate spiritual practices and spiritual friendships to kind of bring us to wholeness and responsibility for the world. So, um, so thank you for listening to that. Thank you for sharing that. It's, uh, that's beautiful. Well, I appreciate, Corey, your efforts digitally in bringing Reverend Angel to us. The woman is really a prophetess. She came to Lake Chautauqua two summers ago here in the northwest section of Pennsylvania. Chautauqua was in the southern part of New York. 
and her message was so clear, but people were getting up and leaving. People whose skin are, is very light were getting up and leaving because uh, it's difficult to hear. It's, it's difficult to hear, but we must, we must embrace our privilege. We must. So I appreciate it, Corey, when you talked about the struggle and it's a struggle that I share with you. Um, how do we really move and continue to do this work um, as people that are of lighter skin? <clears throat> I'm intrigued by a couple of uh, contrasts that I think she brings out really well. Um, one of them is love as opposed to wrath or wrath being an expression of love. I found that very uh, insightful, those comments. And then the other, the fundamental goodness as opposed to fundamental evil or what in a Christian nation, we'd probably say um, original sin. That's uh, something I'm curious to talk to some uh, Christian friends about. Thanks, Eric. And that second one, it kind of determines the perspective like she brings out, are we looking to heal or do we want to punish? And then like Suzanne mentioned, how are, how are children raised? That's, uh, that's a big thing. Yeah, I'm still kind of awestruck by just how beautifully and succinctly she she put forward those perspectives and it's just like, it, it simplifies it in a way. Yeah, it, it's just a beautiful way to simplify it in a way that um, is pretty clear <laughs> in which path we should be taking. Yeah. I think, Amita, I'm uh, mindful that it's uh, a couple minutes before, so do we want to, um, I'm not sure what the, yeah, so the we, weekend. yeah, so here, let me stop the recording.